Number 15, KNBC TV Intruder. August 19, 1987 was a terrifying day for members of KNBC in Los Angeles. Gary Stolman managed to gain access to KNBC studios in Burbank, California by claiming to be a guest of one of the station workers. Because, you know, one of the nicest things about shopping by mail order. Pardon me? What is it? Let me read this. Folks, we have, we have someone on the set who's standing here and would like me to read, um, to read this, uh, this, this copy which was just handed to me. You want to tell me your name or not? Journalist David Horowitz was in the middle of a story when Stolman walked in, pointed his weapon at him and forced him to read a statement he prepared. Horowitz calmly read the statement, which claimed Stolman's father, Max, who worked as the KNBC pharmacist reporter, was not his biological father, but instead a clone created by the CIA with the help of alien beings. Director Tom Capra immediately ordered the station be taken off air, which scared the already jumpy Stolman once he noticed standby messages around the studio. The anchors assured him they were still on air, and Horowitz was allowed to continue. Despite Horowitz's calm demeanor, he admitted later he was frightened, only maintaining the facade in order not to escalate the situation. Once the statement was finished, Stolman immediately placed the weapon on the desk and revealed it was an unloaded BB gun. The entire staff sighed in both relief and disbelief, with Horowitz stating his thought was, you've got to be kidding me. Burbank police rushed in and took Stolman into custody. Number 14. Confrontation on Air News anchors are expected to maintain a level of professionalism while at work. However, there are times where the tempers of the anchors and even their guests can flare over. Two Jordanian journalists were debating the Syrian conflict. Mohammed al Jayasi escalated the already hot topic when he accused fellow guest Shahir al-Johari of supporting the Syrian opposition. Both men began the childish game of pushing the news desk at each other until the table broke. <laughs> the two continued to push the tabletop into each other while the show's host desperately attempted to stop them from directly attacking each other. As the two men moved in closer, studio security rushed in and pulled them aside. The Syrian civil war has had a major impact on the Middle East, including in Jordan. People can hold strong beliefs over current events and cannot like hearing either opposition to those beliefs or when people misinterpret or purposefully spinning your beliefs against you. As the people of Jordan have witnessed, it can nearly lead two people into a full-on brawl. Number 13. Bill Close Crisis on May 28, 1982, at 5 p.m., Joseph Billy Gwynn walked into the KOOL TV office in Phoenix, Arizona, fired a shot into the air, and grabbed production assistant Luis Villa. Gwynn took the station hostage, demanding airtime to read his manifesto, which he believed would prevent a third world war. Police immediately surrounded the building and set up around the newsroom. Negotiations were attempted, but the situation became dire as a desperate Gwynn began making threats to take lives two hours into the crisis. The situation lasted five hours when, at 9.30, news anchor Bill Close agreed to read Gwynn's statement on air. This is the script that Mr. Gwynn gave me, and I'm going to read it verbatim. And uh, anytime you wish to interrupt me. Uh, all right. There is a doctor at St. Luke's who knows about a city called STYNX in New Mexico. I need his help. He's at St. Luke's Hospital. The station went live again, and Close read the 20 minute statement while Gwynn sat next to him. The words read out as the words of a truly disturbed individual, predicting then-Senator Edward M. Kennedy would become president and how nuclear weapons would destroy cities across the United States on July 4, 1984. He also mentioned earlier how ants would overrun the city of Phoenix unless something was done. As soon as the statement was fully read, Gwynn surrendered. In an act of class, Close actually shook Gwynn's hand and even pleaded with officers to lower their weapons as they moved in to make the arrest. Gwynn was found guilty of his actions in the aftermath. 
Close commented afterwards that he felt in control the entire time and said, I think I'll go home and kiss my wife. Number 12. Japan's Big One If asked to name a place where earthquakes frequent, half of people would say California, the other half would say Japan, and both would be correct. Japan suffered a catastrophic earthquake on March 11, 2011, after a massive 9.1 hit off the northern coast of Honshu. On top of that, massive tsunamis slammed into the coast and reached miles inland, sweeping structures and people back into the ocean. The disaster cost $360 billion and took the lives of 15,895 people. Several newsrooms were in the midst of their working days when the earthquake struck, and one member of the NHK crew captured the moment the tremors struck their offices. Sending papers, furniture, and people around their room, the earthquake is the fourth largest on record in the world and the most studied as of 2018. Number 11. In the Lion's Grasp As much as people may want a lion as a pet, it is far from a good idea to have one. Mexican entertainment show Consuelo de Mujer had a couple lion handlers with a young lion on the show in 2003, along with a woman and her young toddler. Without any warning and provocation, the lion reached out and latched its claws onto the toddler's pants, attempting to drag her towards it and also attempting to bite. At first, the mother panics and the toddler begins to scream, but the handler urges them to remain calm as the second handler pulls the lion away. Thankfully, the lion is dragged away and the toddler is uninjured as the claws did not reach her skin. However, the poor child is terrified by that point and begins to cry as the lion is taken off stage. While it seems ridiculous to try and stay calm during such a situation, experts have credited this to saving the child's life as panic would have sent the lion into a frenzy. The show's host gives off a stunned smile, as if he is unable to believe what just happened on the show. I'm sure many of the viewers were also stunned at having nearly witnessed a child mauled on live television. Thankfully, this story does not have a somber ending, and we can all learn to be cautious when around these predatory animals. Number 10. Attempted Self-Immolation some people will go to great lengths in order to draw attention to their cause. Nicola De Martino was invited onto the Italian program TG2, Ted Minuti, to discuss his advocacy for father's rights. Martino and his wife had separated, and she took their son with her to Australia, preventing Martino rights to visitation. It was only after Martino's son had turned 18 were they finally allowed to visit. As his time began, Martino began cryptically talking and then proceeded to pour what turned out to be lighter fluid on himself. Before he could take a match out of his pocket, the host, three technicians, and Martino's son confronted him and wrestled the match out of his hand before sitting him down again. Martino demanded he be allowed to read a letter he had written on his stances, which the host agreed to, on the condition Martino instead paraphrase it, as the letter was way too long. A short time into Martino's speech, the host stopped him and stated he refused to be blackmailed into allowing Martino's letter to be read and he signed off. The host was clearly angry, as before the audio was turned off, he is heard insulting Martino for nearly forcing the other guests and viewers to witness his passing. It can be easy to sympathize with Martino's struggle of not being allowed to see his son, but it is hard to condone his attempt to set himself on fire live to thousands of viewers. Thankfully, the world was spared the grisly outcome this time around. Number 9. Earthquake Live Imagine becoming part of breaking news in the middle of your broadcast. Earthquakes are common and sometimes surprising occurrences for anyone. In several examples, news anchors around the United States have reacted to a sudden earthquake during their live broadcast. The most common area of such instances in the United States have occurred in California. 
but there have also been examples in Oklahoma and Virginia. For the most part, these examples have been minor, but this was not the case for the most recent event. Last year, a Mexican news station was reporting live when the devastating 7.1 earthquake hit Mexico City and the surrounding area. Ustedes ya saben qué es lo que tienen que hacer en este momento: conservar la calma y evacuar de inmediato. Me voy a levantar. causing lights to flicker and the entire set to brutally shake. The anchor urges viewers to remain calm before leaving the set to safety. The quake took the lives of 361 people and 6,000 injured, with numerous buildings collapsing as a result of the 20 seconds of shaking, plus 39 aftershocks. We are told to always expect the unexpected, but it's not every day those reporting the news find the news interrupting their broadcasts. Number 8. Franco Scolio's Last Appearance Our mortality is fragile, and passing on is not always mindful of when it decides to come unannounced. Franco Scolio was a well-known Italian soccer manager who managed 17 teams between 1972 and 2003. He is most famous for coaching Genoa CFC, joking that he would pass away discussing the team. After retiring from managing, he worked as a sports commentator for Al Jazeera. On October 3, 2005, Scolio was a guest on the regional Genoa television news, having a civil debate with then Genoa CFC president Enrico Pizzoli, as he was silently listening to Pizzoli answer a question, Scolio suddenly slumped into his chair unconscious. The host immediately checked to see if Scolio was alright, and after checking his pulse, realized something was very wrong. The station cut to new footage and an ambulance was called. Sadly, Scolio passed away of a heart attack in front of thousands of stunned viewers. His prophecy had come true, passing away in the city he loved and discussing the team he loved. The other guests expressed both shock and sadness over his passing, all undoubtedly disturbed of their witnessing to the unexpected passing. He was a beloved figure in Italian soccer, and his funeral service saw 10,000 people show up to pay their respects. Number 7. WTVA Tornado For the reporters working in Tornado Alley, they are literally on the front lines of bad weather. In most cases, they are the first to report warnings to residents and have been able to maintain broadcasts through various odds in order to continue providing information to those in the storm's path. WTVA out of Tolipo, Mississippi had a tense broadcast on April 28, 2014, when a tornado touched down not far from the studio. Reporting live was meteorologist Matt Labhan, who was following a storm cell forming at around 2 p.m., 30 minutes into the coverage. Labhan went to one of the webcams in the area and saw clear rotation, confirming his suspicions there is a strong chance a tornado was forming. Tornado warnings started coming in for Tolipo and the surrounding counties. Behind him, the radar showed how severe the storm was, with various areas on the map showing red and purple. A significant tornado touchdown just south of our WTVA studios. We may or may not be on the air at this instant. We hope you'll stick with us. Everybody, basement now. Basement now. Labhan immediately went into full gear and began issuing notices for people to seek shelter immediately. The full extent of the severity of this situation struck him when the station took a power hit and briefly shut down their equipment. After the touchdown was confirmed and Labhan saw the size of the tornado from the camera, instinctively he began instructing station crew to rush to the basement. As the tornado approached the studio, when it was confirmed a multi-vortex tornado had formed and was now rushing through Tolipo. Despite all this, Labhan kept relatively calm as he and his co-workers rushed to the basement to await the tornado's passing. It shows how much meteorologists know by being the first to instruct viewers. Number 6. Leanna Canelli Greece has undergone a major financial crisis, which has made the 2008 recession look minuscule. This has led to several years of social and political unrest. 
With the looming threat of Greece being kicked out of the European Union, this has also resulted in a surge of voter support for parties on both the far left and far right side of the political spectrum. Golden Dawn is a far right party running on an anti-immigration platform and have been in a bitter feud with the Greek Communist Party. Greek news station Prono ANT1 hosted a live political debate with politicians from all the major Greek parties including Golden Dawn spokesman Elias Kassaridis and Communist MP Leanna Kennelly. Needless to say, the debate got pretty heated between the two, but it would be Kassaridis who crossed the line. In the midst of the argument, Kassaridis stood up and attacked Kennelly. As he screamed various obscenities at her, while the host, guests, and viewers watched stunned, staff from the newsroom stepped in, removed Caceritas from the set, and locked him in another room as police were called. However, he managed to break down the door and escape. Caceritas was later arrested and charged with assault. And despite the recording proving otherwise, Caceritas and Golden Dawn blame Kennelly for the attack. As of this video's publishing, Caceritas is still on trial. Number 5. A Husband's Passing When something bad happens somewhere, the whole nation can feel it. For one anchor in India, it was a lot closer to home than she ever wanted it to be. Supreet Kaur was reporting on a major traffic accident that took the lives of three people. While documenting the accident, she began feeling a horrible feeling that her husband may have been one of the people who passed away, but kept her composure and continued reading the rest of the news. The broadcast itself is not telling, and Cor only briefly broke when her voice cracked, but kept going. After she signed off, Cor left the studio and burst into tears, then called one of the reporters on the scene, and her worst nightmare had been confirmed. She had indeed just reported on the passing of her husband live on air, possibly one of the worst experiences any news anchor has ever experienced during work. The reporter on the scene had in fact known her husband had perished, but decided to not tell her live in order to maintain Cor's privacy and not risk her having an emotional collapse while millions watched. It's scary to know how the mortality of those we love and care about can sneak up on us, but none of us have ever had to experience the heartbreak Cor now knows. Number 4. Chattanooga Hailstorm Storms are a common and often exciting experience, and for people living in Tornado Alley, storms of all magnitudes have become common occurrence. Local meteorologist Paul Berries of WRCB Chattanooga was reporting on a developing storm cell when golf ball-sized hail bombarded the news studio. He describes the sound as similar to someone with a jackhammer on the roof. Fellow meteorologist Nick Austin had trouble hearing Paul. Despite the two being in close proximity to one another, despite remaining calm, Paul is still clearly in shock and nervous, stating several times the last time such a hailstorm happened in Chattanooga, the city was struck by a tornado. It's golf ball size. Okay. Size. Now it's golf ball size hail. It's bigger and that Great. causes damage. Whenever there's a golf cars. ball size hail, there's always that potential. Golf ball size hail, it's sort of in the dark here. Despite the situation, Paul continues his forecast, warning people to stay away from windows, pull over to the side of the road, and preemptively take shelter, all while keeping a close eye on the tornado index, showing how well he has managed to predict the weather. Paul asks Austin if there is a tornado warning, and right at that moment a warning is issued. One commenter on the video has described other instances where Paul has shown incredible courage during broadcasts. According to this person, Paul stayed on the air for 12 hours while several tornadoes formed and hit the surrounding area, crediting him, Austin, and third meteorologist David Carnes as saving many lives during the disaster. Number 3. WREX Tornado May 22, 2011 was a scary day for the staff of WREX in Rockford, Illinois. 
An F1 tornado formed not far from the station, and it was soon clear the building was right in the tornado's path. Mid-sentence during the weather report, the station audio cut out, and viewers were left looking at the satellite radar in silence as crews scrambled to evacuate the studio. Field and... Unbelievable. In eight, in eight years, I have never heard a thunderstorm like this. If you're in Rockford, you need to be underground now. The station went back on air, still focused on the radar, but the sounds of a siren and high winds is heard over the anchor's voice. The anchors continued to broadcast from the basement, warning citizens to take shelter immediately and also describing the happenings around the station. According to them, 75 mile per hour winds blew debris and hail against the building. The sound of both the wind and hail made it nearly impossible for viewers to hear the anchors, and the two retreated back into the basement. The nervousness in their voices became evident, and they also expressed wonder as to where their crew went. Thankfully, everyone was safely in a basement stairwell, and all escaped harm. Number 2. Dutch TV Hostage 2015 was a tough year in Europe. Days following the first Paris attack, another incident happened in Hilversum, Netherlands, which went completely under the radar. In the evening of January 30th, a 19-year-old man in a suit walked into the NOS news studios with a weapon, demanding to speak with someone from CNN. The broadcast quickly cut to the title card citing technical difficulties, but the cameras continued to record what was happening in the newsroom. The man allowed most of the staff to leave the room, then paced as he waited to speak with CNN. He remained calm and assured the remaining staff he had no intention of hurting them, saying the weapon is only in case things go crazy. He even states to a man not to worry because he is just as nervous as they are. He continues to talk with those left in the room, saying he already knows police are preparing to enter and that as soon as he has finished his statement, everyone will be free to go and he will surrender to authorities. As technicians are claiming to be working on getting the broadcast working, Dutch police enter and order the man to surrender. Immediately upon seeing the police, the man drops the weapon and raises his hands, following the officer's orders. It was later discovered the weapon was a replica, proving the man's desire not to harm anyone. The investigation concluded the man acted alone, was not motivated by extremism, but were unable to determine a motive for the incident. He was convicted of his actions later that year. Before we get to number 1, my name is Chills and I hope you're enjoying my narration. If you're curious about what I look like in real life, then go to my Instagram at DylanIsChillinYT and tap that follow button to find out. I'm currently doing a super poll on my Instagram. If you believe ghosts are real, then go to my most recent photo and tap the like button. If you don't, DM me saying why. When you're done, come right back to this video to find out the number one entry. Also, follow me on Twitter at YT underscore chills because that's where I post video updates. It's a proven fact that generosity makes you a happier person. So if you're generous enough to hit that subscribe button and the bell beside it, then thank you. This way, you'll be notified of the new videos we upload every Tuesday and Saturday. Number 1. WCPO Hostage Situation The staff of WCPO in Cincinnati weren't prepared for the event that would change their lives on October 15, 1980. Early that morning, James Hoskins walked into the station armed to the teeth, which he used to take over the studio. He began by taking reporter Elaine Green and her cameraman hostage before forcing his way into the newsroom, where a further seven were held captive. During the standoff, Green remained calm and even began to interview Hoskins in order for him to explain his motives. In the eerie interview, Hoskins details how he already took the life of his girlfriend. However, he promised he would not hurt the hostages and would let them go once they helped him fortify the entrances. Sure enough, he kept his word and all were released unharmed. Before leaving, all those present pleaded with Hoskins to surrender and get help, but his mind was made up. During the crisis, news reporters and anchors were broadcasting from the parking lot as events unfolded. 
Police negotiators attempted to talk Hoskins into surrendering, but again he refused. The negotiator, Dale Mencos, described Hoskins as the coldest person he had ever spoken to, with how Hoskins bluntly described taking the life of his girlfriend and how nonchalantly he stated his wish to take his own life moments before doing so. It was during this conversation Hoskins motives became clear, where he expressed anger towards the local government and aimed to create chaos in the city via a shootout with the police. This never materialized, and the only fatality that day was Hoskins. To this day, those who went through the ordeal continue to express the horror of what happened, and thankful the incident didn't end much worse. Thanks for checking out this video. Be sure to subscribe because we upload new countdowns every Tuesday and Saturday. Or if you're still not convinced, here are some of our other videos that I think you'd like. Enjoy!